developed as a total package, Bucky O'Hare got his start on the comic pages, but quickly blasted off with his very own animated series, two video games from Konami, and a line of action figures and vehicles from Hasbro. Released in an era where anthropomorphic superheroes, such as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, were all the rage, Bucky O'Hare and the Toad Wars had all of the makings to be the next major success. But unfortunately, it seems that wasn't meant to be. Cut short at only 13 episodes of television and one wave of action figures. We're exploring the short-lived but awesome 1991 line of Bucky O'Hare action figures from Hasbro today on Toy Explosion. Bucky O'Hare tells the story of a parallel universe where a war is ongoing between the United Federation of Animals and the sinister Toad Empire under control by an evil computer system known as Complex. Bucky, a green hare and captain of a frigate named the Righteous Indignation, leads a crew consisting of his first mate Jenny, a four-armed pirate named Deadeye Duck, an advanced AFC android named Blinky, and a pre-teen human genius named Willie DeWitt to put a stop to Complex, the Toad Air Marshal, and the entire Toad Empire. Bucky got his start as a comic book series published by Continuity Comics in the mid-1980s. The series was first developed in 1978, created by Larry Hama, well known for his work in Marvel Comics, as well as the man behind many of the beloved G.I. Joe comics and file cards. As well as Michael Golden, an illustrator who has worked for both DC and Marvel on comics such as Batman, Superman, Chris Star, and Micronauts. Together with Neil Adams of Continuity Comics, a comic series was born, and by the early 1990s, Bucky O'Hare and his cast of characters were ready to expand to a full-on franchise, thanks in part to the immense popularity of another anthropomorphic team of superheroes known as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Maybe you've heard of those guys. The animated series Bucky O'Hare and the Toad Wars debuted in 1991. Konami released two video games, one in the arcades and one on the Nintendo Entertainment System. And then Hasbro released a line of action figures. Bucky O'Hare, it seemed, was headed for success. While it's true that many of the cartoons we adore today were created for the sole purpose of selling toys, it's quite interesting to see just how much of a plan this was from the very beginning with Bucky. In an interview with BuckyO'Hare.org, creator Larry Hama had this to say. It was the whole deal at the inception. I designed the toys first. That's why the comic characters have 3mm holes in their feet and have 3mm plugs on their belts. I wanted the comic and animated characters to be exactly the same as the toys, with no compromise. I knew the first year's run of Star Wars toys was hurt by the fact that the spaceship designs were pretty impossible to replicate in plastic at a decent price break. That's why I designed the toys first or at least designed the toy concept. Larry Hama. This is completely amazing to me. And if you look at the comic book art, which predates the toys by several years, you can see exactly what he's talking about. The knobs on the character's belts for holstering the guns are drawn just as they appear as an action feature on the action figures. Even the vehicles are designed with screw bosses and the characters have holes in the bottom of their feet Unreal! So, why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at those toys? Let's kick things off with our main hero. The figures in this line are in that 5 inch scale, but Bucky here is a tad shorter, coming in at around 4 inches tall. He's very bright and colorful, with a red and yellow uniform and the signature green of his fur. 
The character in the comics and cartoon was a bit thinner, while this action figure has a chunkier, more squat look to it. Regardless, the sculpt is pretty great, easily recognizable and capturing the appropriate details of the artwork, which was always Larry Hama's intent. The articulation is basic, featuring nine points. The head turns at the neck, and the legs move forward and backwards at the hips. Rather than moving at the shoulders, Bucky's arms instead swivel at the bicep, making it so that his forearms only move more outwards rather than up and down. He does feature swivels at the gloves, as well as swivels at the ears, allowing for some posing unique for this character. He has one accessory, a laser pistol. This pistol can be plugged into either hand. There's also a small hole in the pistol. This is a gimmick that you're gonna notice on all of the weapons across the line. The notches on Bucky's belt, which comes straight out of the design of the comics, are meant to holster the pistol by plugging into that hole. It's a cool feature, but the issue is that the gun does not fit on the side notches due to the limited arm articulation. You can plug it onto the front notch, but admittedly, that looks a bit odd. The one-eyed, four-armed, dead-eyed duck stands slightly taller than Bucky. Like Bucky, he's brightly colored with a mostly orange color palette. Featuring seven points of articulation, the figure has basic movement at the neck, the legs, and the shoulders. The extra arms gives him that extra boost in the articulation count, but he essentially functions like a typical five points of articulation action figure that was common for the time. Deadeye Duck has a slight action pose going on with his sculpt. His right leg is molded in a way that he stands more on his toes with that foot, as if he's taking a step forward. This was another common trend seen on other popular toy lines at the time, namely TMNT. We'll see this pop up on other figures in this line too. Since Deadeye has four arms, he needs four laser pistols. Each hand can hold one of those pistols. We even get different sculpts on three of them, which is a nice touch. Each also has the signature hole through the back, which Deadeye does have four notches on the straps across his chest. I found that his pistols are a bit too loose to properly plug into him though. A 10 year old genius from another dimension, Willie DeWitt found himself in the Anniverse and now assists Bucky and his team during the Toad Wars. In an effort to keep Willie a secret from the Toad Empire, Willie wears a Berserker Baboon disguise, complete with a removable helmet. The glasses are a nice touch on the figure, but since they are a separate piece, it's not uncommon to find these missing from figures found in the wild. Along with the helmet, Willie also includes his own blaster. It has that same feature of being able to be stored on a notch on his belt, but it's worth noting that it doesn't fit on the notch on the front of his belt. The one on the back, however, works perfectly. Willie features less articulation than most. His arms move up and down at the shoulders and his wrists swivel and his legs move at the hips, but his head does not articulate, so he's always looking forwards. Blinky is on the shorter side compared to everyone else, but is a very fun looking figure. He is the crew's AFC, which stands for Android First Class. He's mostly a light gray in color, and his head is one large eye with a bright orange color to it. One thing that makes Blinky unique from the rest of the figures is his articulation. Some of it is basic, such as the head turning left and right, and the legs moving forward and backward, but his arms are made of a softer plastic with a bendy wire inside. This allows you to flex and bend the arms into various poses. Blinky includes a large red backpack that plugs onto his back. It features a blue cannon over his shoulder and a clip on the side to holster his laser pistol. His pistol fits a little loose in his hand due to them being made of that softer plastic, but the blaster itself is really unique. It looks like it was hodgepodge together with various tools. You can see a hammer, a screwdriver, a wrench. It's a really fun sculpt. That backpack does cause some balance issues due to it being a bit top heavy on Blinky's back. You really have to bend him way forward just to keep him standing while he's wearing it. 
Bruiser the Berserker Baboon was created specifically for the animated series. He's one of the larger figures in the line with great ape-like proportions. His left arm is stretched downward with a clenched fist the way a gorilla would plant his knuckles on the ground. His right arm is positioned to hold onto his larger blaster rifle. That blaster rifle can also be holstered on the notch on his hip. His articulation is basic and on par with what we see with most of the figures in the line. His head rotates at the neck, but because of his hunched back, it more rocks side to side rather than looking left and right. Otherwise, his arms move up and down at the shoulders, his wrists swivel, and his legs move at the hips. He's a really great looking figure, with bright orange fur and silver armor bits breaking up that color. He's a real tough guy too, as you can see by the pierced nose with a chain hooked to his ear and all the spikes all over his armor. No toads are going to want to mess with this guy. Another character created for the animated series, Commander Dogstar is the captain of the space frigate Indefatigable. Similar to Bucky, Dogstar has shoulder tassels on his uniform. He wears silver armor on his chest and boots, which looks pretty nice on the figure, as it's molded with a plastic that has a marbleized shine to it. It's much shinier than the silver plastic that was used for Blinky. He dual wields laser pistols, which looks awesome, but it's worth noting that he's one of those figures who cannot holster his weapons as the notches on the front and back of his armor just aren't big enough to store those guns for some reason. He features the same basic articulation found on most of the figures in the lineup. He's also one of the figures that includes one of those dynamic stances, with his left leg placed a little further back, standing on his toes as if he's lunging forward. Now, on to the bad guys, who are way outnumbered by the good guys in this line. The Toad Air Marshal is our shortest figure, standing right at 3 inches tall. I love the sculpt on this guy. His wart covered green face has so much expression, with his teeth gritting sneer and his bulging eyes. He has a removable hat that just plugs onto his head via a peg and a hole. It's pretty common to find this guy missing his hat as a result. He also includes a large cannon weapon that can be held in his right hand. There's a small bayonet attached to the front which is removable and can be held by the air marshal and used as a knife. His left hand is pointing, which is awesome. This allows you to pose the air marshal as if he's barking orders at his bumbling storm toad troopers. This is your army builder of the line, as the Storm Toad Troopers are the generic looking army of the evil Toad Empire. They all look the same, wearing green helmets and the same blue and gold uniforms. These guys also look more like frogs than toads, as their skin is smooth and not covered in warts like the Toad Air Marshals. The articulation is the same as seen on most, with the head turning at the neck, the arms moving at the shoulders, the wrists swiveling, and the legs moving at the hips, but we have got to talk about the sculpt of those legs. The Storm Toad Trooper is one of those figures who really suffers from that dynamic stance sculpt. His right foot is on its toes as if he's running, but for some reason, the way the legs are positioned, it's almost like they're fighting against each other. It's difficult to get this guy standing, and his legs always look awkward as a result. The evil Toad Borg was created by Complex to oversee and lead his empire. He was a living toad whose organic parts were replaced by mechanical components. He's a very cool looking baddie, although the action figure does seem to be lacking some of the details of the artwork. Most of the detail on his face except for his eyes are unpainted, just a solid dark blue plastic. That's a shame, because some more paint here really could have brought out the amazing sculpted details. He has a larger blaster rifle which is unique in the way that the figure holds it. There are two handles, one of which fits in the Toad Borg's hand, while the other plugs into his forearm. It does have the typical hole on the back of the gun, but Toad Borg does not have any of those notches for holstering weapons. Toad Borg is another figure with a weird stance. 
His right leg and foot are molded in such a way that you have to pose him with that leg further back in order to keep him standing. It's an odd one, and it seems a bit unnecessary. Speaking of his legs, Toadborg has a known paint variation. While it seems the more common version of the figure has gold painted legs, there is also a version out there with dark brown legs. Another character made for the animated series and toy line, Owl Negator, is my personal favorite of the bad guys. There's just something wild about his color scheme that really works. His eyes are bright green, with a mouth filled with sharp teeth that match. His scaly skin is a deep purple, with black trim and a shiny gold bodysuit. Articulation is what you'd expect, but he's another figure whose head more rocks side to side due to the shape of his body. And while he does have a slight wide stance, his feet do stand mostly flat, so he's not really stuck in one of those awkward poses. Oh, and he's got a tail that swivels. He's a really fun design through and through. So by the way, we've seen over and over how the figures have those notches for holstering their weapons. It's also worth noting that one of the major features across the entire line is that their weapons are meant to be interchangeable with one another. I know that sounds a bit silly, because of course you can swap weapons between figures if you want to, but this is actually touted on the figure's packaging. But here's an instance worth noting. Many of the figures have holes on their backs. Blinky is the only figure that comes with an accessory for those holes. So, as you might guess, that pack can be plugged onto the backs of other figures. Kind of fun. This is an awesome looking ship. Made for the evil Toad Empire, the Toad Double Bubble is a large ship shaped like a toad's head. The bulbous red eyes on the top are actually the cockpits. You can open up the clear red domes to see two figures inside the craft. On either side are claws that can be fired off by pulling the triggers on the underside. These claws are attached to the ship by bungee strings, so as they fire off, they stay attached. You can use these to grapple your heroic action figures. There are several stickers used to decorate the ship, and most of them are pretty cool, but these little dots that are meant to give a wart-like pattern to the ship just don't stick very well. They have a tendency to peel pretty badly, which is a shame, because if they could stay attached, they actually really help add some great decoration to the otherwise plain green of the ship. There's a really great action feature sound effect. By rocking the ship side to side, the ship croaks. And this is not an electronic action feature, so no batteries are required. It's a really cool effect. The Toad Croaker is a small one-man ship designed for our heroes. It's really wacky, as this ship is designed specifically to smash the Toad enemies. The overall design looks like a large blue shoe, adding to the silliness of it. By stomping down, the bulb on the bottom squishes inward and essentially works like a whoopee cushion, making a noise that is supposed to be the toad getting, well, croaked. It's totally wacky, and I totally love it. While it's a fun line of action figures and vehicles, unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be for Bucky O'Hare. The cartoon lasted only one season, and the toy line only lasted one series. This quick cancellation is often blamed on the poor distribution of the toys. I'm pretty disappointed that we couldn't get a second season, all the result of a shipping and distribution error in getting the toy assortments to the stores that first Christmas. The assortments went out with the same number of Bucky figures as, let's say, Toad Air Marshal. That's nuts! The Bucky figures disappeared immediately, and all that were left on the racks were Air Marshals and Toad Troopers. There should have been twice as many Buckies and Willies. Larry Hama. As a result of the quick ending to the toy line, there were a number of action figures and vehicles never released that were nearly ready to go. Thanks to Hasbro's 1992 Toy Fair catalog, we can get a good look at many of these. New vehicles would have included the Toad Bomber, the Twin Turbo Toad Thrasher, and the Battle Bucket. 
even a massive righteous indignation was set to be released. And the next wave of action figures would have seen the release of the Total Terror Toad, Bucky in his spacesuit, Pit Stop Pete, Kamikaze Camo, Rumblebee, Sly Lizard, and the one that probably hurts the most, First Mate Jenny. Making it even worse, Jenny was reportedly even slated for the first wave, but got pushed back. There are even carded photos of Jenny floating around on the internet. We were so close to getting her. While things didn't go as expected for Bucky and company back in the 90s, it's not a completely sad story. In 2017, toy company Boss Fight Studio introduced a brand new line of highly detailed Bucky O'Hare action figures with the collector in mind. With modern articulation, a slew of accessories and interchangeable parts, and sculpts that do an amazing job of capturing the look of the original artwork, Boss Fight has already delivered several new figures that have garnered much praise. So far, these new figures include Bucky O'Hare, Deadeye Duck, and yes, even First Mate Jenny delivering a figure that longtime fans of the franchise have always dreamed of owning. From comic to animation to video games to toys, Bucky O'Hare feels like he should have seen more success than he got. But what we got is honestly pretty great. Sure, it's a shame that we missed out on so much, but with the new toys from companies like Boss Fight, combined with the fandom keeping the spirit alive, the crew of the Righteous Indignation keep pressing on. Thank you guys so much for joining me for another installment of Toy Explosion. Toy Explosion is a Patreon supported show. Massive thanks to all the folks you see scrolling across the screen right now, as I definitely could not have done this without their help. For more information on how you can become a supporter of Toy Explosion, head on over to patreon.com slash pixeldan. I also want to give a very special thanks to my friend Sam Wells at Toy Du Jour, an amazing toy store up in Chicago. He supplied me with the scans of his Toy Fair catalog from Hasbro, which gave us a good look at all those missed Bucky toys that we'll never get. Uh, but Sam is awesome. Toy Du Jour is awesome. If you're ever in Chicago, make sure you hit that store up and check it out. Also want to give a special shout out to my friend Kevin from SEO Toy Review. He supplied a few extra voiceovers for this particular episode. Hey, you guys know the Bucky O'Hare cartoon series, the animated uh, series intro there, that theme song, one of my all-time favorite cartoon theme songs. But did you know that Larry Hama, the creator of Bucky O'Hare, not only did he not watch the cartoon series, but the one thing he has said about it is that he hates the theme song. What? 